Hello. Ooh, that was loud. I'm ready. I'm ready. All right. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, this is really awesome. Thank you all so much for coming out. My name is Hannah. I'm the director of placemaking for the Mill District. And tonight we're kicking off uh, what we hope will be an ongoing, in perpetuity, speaker series, just opening up stories in the community and giving an opportunity to have some conversation and learn things about one another. So the Mosley family has incredibly graciously agreed to kick it off tonight for us. Um, so we do have some post-its around. If you have questions, please feel free to write them down and I'm gonna go around and gather them towards the end and then hand them off to the family so they can answer some questions um, after they've had a chance to share openly. Um, and we did want to point out that tonight is being videotaped, just so everybody's aware of that, um, because we want this conversation to be able to have a wide reach, so we'll have it online um, and give people a chance to watch it, and hopefully that will inspire them to come to future series. Um, and if there are any of you in the room or people that you know that you think those stories should be told and would be really wonderful to put out there, please let me know. I have some business cards, but we just want to open it up and have it be a really organic community thing that people feel is accessible to them to tell their story. So we're going to start it tonight. I'm going to hand it off to Amelia and the Mosley family, and thank you again for making the time. Thank you, Hannah. Hi everyone, how's everybody doing tonight? Woo! Woo! Yes. So I'm gonna get right into things. Um, I'm gonna start off with some questions. How many people read about school integration in the newspapers? Raise your hand. Okay, a couple. How many people read about school integration in the history books? All right. Um, well, my parents were there and um, do you know how many black people in America, were, how black people in America were treated um, when they were called the N-word? And would you like to hear what it means to me and my family today? Yes. We'd like to have a civil conversation around these issues and around race and tell our unique story. So I'm here to tell you our story. It's a story of success. It's a story of triumphs. It's a story of challenges and, sadly, the role that oppression plays in this evolution. Oftentimes, there is a monolithic representation of um, what it means to be black throughout uh, the history of the United States. But we're here to show you that every story is unique, starting with ours. Our story is that of civil rights progress in America, but don't make the mistake of assuming our experience or opinions are the same as other black people's, because they're just ours. So maybe we're more open about talking about these issues because we share the Mill District's goals of respect, understanding, and progress. So you guys were given handouts of information. I urge you to consider the timeline of these historical events in relation to uh, my family's own personal accounts of our histories. And um, are you guys ready to get deep? Yeah. All right, let's do it. Um, so first I wanna introduce, this is my dad, Dr. Albert Mosley. This is my mom, Kathleen Mosley. My brother, Charles Mosley, AKA Moses. And my daughter, Yasola Daldu. First topic that we're gonna start with is Brown versus Board of Education. How many people know about Brown versus Board of Education? All right, so we're gonna tell you a little bit about that um, today. And um, my experience of it is only through the history books. Um, it took place in 1954. It's when um, the schools were desegregated. So prior to Brown versus Board of Education, all of the schools um, were divided, in this country, were divided by race. So black kids went to black schools, white kids went to white schools. And obviously class played a role in that. Access to materials, access to the proper education played a role in that. Um, in 1957, nine black students known as the Little Rock Nine 
were actually blocked from integrating into the Little Rock Central High School in Arkansas. And in the Deep South, this is where desegregation um, was really not well received. Um, and it was so bad that President Dwight D. Eisenhower had to send federal troops in to escort these children to school so that they weren't harmed. Um, I want to start off by my parents were there, uh, not in Arkansas, but they were um, part of this, this movement. So I want to start off with you, Dad, and just tell us your experience um, growing up in Tennessee during that time. Thank you very much. Thank you much, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> I was born in Tennessee, uh, about 10 miles from the Mississippi River. And uh, this was in 1941, so you're looking at a dinosaur. <laughs> okay. But it's good to be able to share my life this way. Uh, in 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education outlawed as unconstitutional segregation in this country. In 1897, it had been legalized by Plessy versus Ferguson. So this was a huge turn around in 1954. At that time, I would have been 13 years old, and the school I did went in was totally segregated. I uh, graduated in 1958, four years after Brown, and segregation was still de jure. That is a matter of fact throughout the South. Um, I was raised in, uh, uh, in a small town, about 10,000, where most people made their living picking cotton or growing cotton, so that the schools were time to harvesting and everyone was expected to be in the fields. Uh, I was uh, uh, spared a lot of this because my father was a businessman. We owned a cafe, a pool hall, and a hotel, mostly hotel. So I was raised counting money and playing pool. Okay. I uh, graduated in 1958 and I went to the segregated uh, college for Tennessee called Tennessee State A&I, Agricultural and Industrial, which had been founded to again tra uh, train freedmen in the mechanical arts. I was at Tennessee State from 1958 to 1960. Okay. I majored in math there, but my true major was music. I played a lot of music at Tennessee State, a lot of great bands. In fact, I left Nashville because my brother warned my parents that I'd probably go on the road with one of the bands that were coming through, and I would have, it would have been a great adventure. Yeah. But instead, uh, they shipped me out of Tennessee and I went to the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Okay. I was still majoring in mathematics, even though the high school I went to did not even offer a geometry course. Okay, so even now, I've never had a course in geometry. But I graduated from the University of Wisconsin in mathematics in 1963. This was a time of great upheaval in this country where the sit-ins and the freedom rides. I had participated in Nashville in uh, the sit-ins at the lunch counters where you have to go through a lot of training because people would come in and hit you, spit on you, throw you off. You know, but uh, it clearly was a time of change. Uh, as I said, in 1963, I graduated from Wisconsin and I went into philosophy to, make, to do something that would bring me closer to the civil rights struggle that was going on. Uh, I got a bachelor's and then a, a went on for a PhD work in philosophy. I studied at Oxford. My field is logic and philosophy of science. 
Uh, from Oxford, I went to Washington, D.C. I taught at Howard University and then at the newly formed Federal City College, which became the University of the District of Columbia. I have tried to devote my life to helping people who are, have been uh, oppressed and who have inherited oppression. While in Washington, I taught in the prisons there. When we left Washington, we went to Ohio, and I taught in the prisons in Appalachia, Ohio. From uh, Ohio, we came here to uh, Northampton, and I've been here for the last 20 years. Now I am retiring. <laughs> but I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have about any or all of this or any of the professional things I do. Thanks, Dad. And remember, I said we were going to talk about our challenges. I don't think I can imagine majoring in mathematics having not taken geometry. I can barely help my eighth grader with her math homework now, so we have tutors for that. So. <laughs> um, but the challenges are real, um, and overcoming them is, is really important. And um, I think my dad said something very powerful when um, we think about inheriting oppression. There's a lot of things that many of us have inherited in this room, but we don't often think about inheriting oppression and how to help people under those circumstances. So thank you for that, Dad. Um, Mom, tell us about your experience with um, the effects of Brown versus Board of Education. Okay, hello, good evening. I, oh my goodness, is this coming up? Okay, so first of all, let me just say one thing. My name is Kathleen Sims Mosley, and I grew up in Washington, D.C. Uh, I was born in 1944, so by 1950, whatever it was, the Brown versus Brown, uh, uh, Brown versus uh, education had already uh, started and was already in place. Uh, but before I say anything else, I want to say one thing about Washington, D.C., because it was still highly segregated, and nobody was called black in Washington, D.C. We were called colored, and we were known as colored people. So that was something that, um, again, and nobody, or Negroes, okay, so there was no black, there was no Afro-American, there was just colored people and Negroes, and most of us were called colored people, and if we saw a friend, we'd say, you know, hey, colored, whatever. So that's, uh, that's just a, uh, a moniker that existed then in Washington, D.C., and probably all over, all over the South, um, if they weren't called girl or boy. So, um, so growing up in Washington, D.C., my parents' uh, uh, mother, actually, and her side of the family grew up in, in South Carolina, and they migrated first with my aunt and my mother to Washington, D.C. to get jobs in the, in the government there. There were lots of clerical jobs that were available because of the fact of uh, World War II, and there was a lot of money, and they needed to fill the positions with uh, government clerical workers. So my aunt and mother were glad to get out of, out of the South. They lived in Sumter, South Carolina, and they were glad to migrate north along with many of the other great migrations that were uh, going on at the time. Um, and my, um, uh, uh, let's, let's, my grandmother, who taught school, she was a, um, she was the first one really uh, in our family who got a college degree. Her father was a Presbyterian minister, and she was able to go to a Presbyterian-run school called Scotia Seminary, and she got a degree from there in um, early childhood education, and she became a teacher. She remained in the South for 30 years before she came north, and then she came and joined my mother and, uh, and, and, and my aunt. So we composed the nucleus of the family. When we got, when I lived in D.C., for the first seven years of my life, I lived in a area that was so segregated. It was wonderful, but lots of children to play with, lots of friends, parents had all good friends. It was like almost a little heaven. But I never really knew anything about white people. 
other than when I got on the bus or something and I put my school token in, you know, to pay my way on the bus. So I didn't have a relationship or any kind of concept of what it meant to be a white person from a black person's perspective. So, because everybody, everybody was black. And there was a community of black people that we thrived on. The churches were black. They had all kinds of things going on. I went to a dancing school that was black uh, and, and all. And so, so I didn't have a, any sense of what it meant to be a black person uh, dealing with, uh, with, with racism or white. Uh, and I didn't think about it, even looking at TV. It was just TV. It wasn't about, oh, there's some white people on TV. You know, if I like the show Howdy Doody, you know, then um, we looked at it. So that was the way it was until we moved. And once we moved out of this environment that we lived in, which was marvelous, um, we moved into an area in the northwest section of DC. It's called the Petworth section. Once we moved to Petworth, all of that changed because we lived, we were the second black family to move onto the block. So there were all these white people around and it was a different kind of dynamic, which as a child, I saw immediately. And it was okay too because kids are kids and so, and that's how it was. And we all played together because nobody went in anybody's house back then, you know. We all played in the street, kickball, jump rope, hopscotch, whatever it was, we were always outside. So we didn't have that uh, sense of, uh, uh, of you know, you, you can't come into my house because you're black or I can't go into your house because, you know, whatever, you know, because you're white. And so it was a very different kind of dynamic. But what uh, actually happened and what really um, turned the tables for me was that the schools were still segregated. And when we moved there, I was in the fifth grade. So I stayed in a black school in the fifth grade, which was fine. It was just farther from my house, but it was OK. Because uh, I didn't know anything else, and I didn't want anything else, and I didn't think of anything else. But when uh, my parents put in for a transfer, because they, again, knew what was going on, and they wanted me to be in a, what they considered to be a better school. So I was transferred to a school called the William B. Powell Elementary School. Uh, it, yeah, oh, well, yeah, I have a picture. <laughs> I actually found my sixth grade picture, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, but it was, it, was, it was a really cool school because it was so, this was in like 1956 or 57. It looked just like something you would see today because it was so diverse. It was really, I mean, we had an uh, Indian uh, ch captain of the patrols. Uh, I became the second lieutenant. You know, we had such a wonderful mix of people there. So, you know, life continued to be very happy. And I was, you know, very happy about being there. And the teacher, you know, I thought was a wonderful teacher. So there were, it didn't seem like there were any problems. Everybody got along. Again, we played outside unless it was raining. So we were always doing some sports or doing something together. Tell and us what your teacher said. Well, I'm getting to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so that's my bubble, and it was really great, and everybody was really good, and it was all so much fun, and, and it was nice because, um, because the rooms in the school were not hot like at my other school, and, uh, and everything it was just great. However, one day, uh, uh, we were, my seatmate was white, by the way, her name was Beth. My best friend was black, her name was Jackie, but if you see the picture, you can see there was a really good mix. And on this particular day, I don't know what caused it, but my uh, <laughs> the teacher, our beloved teacher, I don't know, I guess she just lost it. And all of a sudden she said, will you little colored children please just stop talking? You're always talking. I'm sick of hearing you talk. Just stop. Why is it always the little colored children? Why? You know? And she was just red in the face and upset. And we were stunned. So we, my, my seatmate Beth and I both looked at the teacher and, you know, and then we looked at each other and we burst out laughing, you know, and that was the end of it, you know, but, but that was my first sense of some kind of actual racism, you know, because 
I mean, really, you know, and it was just, that's, that's, that's what it was. So that's what started me to really think about it and be more observant of it. And then, of course, as time went on, lots of other things happened, too, and it was D.C. But that was the very first, first time. We have lots more to cover, so we will right. uncover those times as well. But I can't imagine myself um, living in those times. Uh, I am extremely outspoken and verbally aggressive, and I <laughs> would have probably found myself in big trouble, uh, if not dead, which is sad. It's funny now. Do you have a question, Joe? I have two things. Yeah. Did your grandmother graduate from college? Yes, she did. Uh, yeah. Was, I, she, was she black? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I wonder, she I, must have been. Uh, oh, her diploma is here. Her I college. Wonder, I, it's old, it's old, it's old, it's that's from 1894. So that's my great grandmother's yeah. diploma. Yeah. So in my family. Many, but, but, I, I'm sorry, but how many black women at that time? Very rare. Very little. Very, very few women and very few black people and even fewer black women. But be very careful when you pass this around because. The other question I had was, why did your family move? You love your neighborhood, why did they move? Oh, in D.C.? Well, they moved because, um, um, they moved because basically where we lived was, um, it's called, it was a place called Benning Heights and it was developed for people who were coming uh, from the South uh, it wasn't a project, but it was a development. And it was developed for people who were coming from the South to work because they were trying to bring people to fill those clerical jobs. And so it was developed because of that. And uh, the, place was, the places were very nice, it was very large. But my um, mother and uh, father and, and aunt and grandmother just wanted to get it. They wanted a house. And these were, even though they were three and four bedroom units and very, very nice, um, they wanted they wanted a house, and my grandmother had brought money that she got from her house that she sold when she moved moved to, to, to be with her uh, daughters, uh, and so they she and my aunt were able to buy a house, and that's that was their goal to to have a house, and so that's why we moved, and we moved into an area in Washington D.C. that was still a um, it was a very white area, but it was um, it was more like. Um, uh, I guess you would say maybe working class, but it was really, 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 really nice. Shepherd Street was where it was in, in Washington, D.C., the Petworth area. And uh, what happened was, as, as I said, we were the second people on the block. And by the end of the year, most of the white people had moved out to the suburbs. So they, and there were just very few uh, white people left because again, this was another type of migration and white people were seeing this influx of black people because of the clerical jobs and you know the better economic status and everything. And so they were fleeing and black people were moving into the city, uh, which became an urbanized thing after a while. And the white people were going out to the suburbs. So by the end of a, a year or two, most of them had gone. But we still had a wonderful time because the people who came in were still black and very cool and wonderful and so, so, so that's why. It was economics and you know, just wanting to have a house. Everybody wanted to have a house in the 50s. <laughs> Um, uh, Dr. Mosley actually has to leave in a couple of minutes to go give a talk in Northampton, so I want to cover um, a few more things before he takes off. But before we get to these topics, I did want to just talk about the education system. Um, I guess from uh, my perspective, my brother's perspective, and my daughter's perspective, because we have three generations here, and uh, I think my parents experience is so vastly different from our experience, which is also so vastly different from my daughter's experience. It's good to have um, an idea or a sense of how general generational shifts occur and, um, and not only oppression is invested, but opportunities and challenges morph and so on and so forth. So when we were growing up, um, I was born in DC 
Um, so I lived in D.C., partly in D.C., and then partly in Appalachia, Ohio. As my dad said, he went, moved to, um, taught at the, the Ohio University there. And it was a very different experience for me because D.C., where I grew up, was also predominantly black. So I went to a Catholic school, which was predominantly black. Um, and my neighborhood was predominantly black. My parents stayed in the Petworth area in Northwest. And um, so there wasn't a lot of, even though segregation wasn't uh, legal and it wasn't something that was talked about, it was still something that was, you know, you had black neighborhoods and you had white neighborhoods. So it was still very, um, very much present. Um, and then when we moved to Ohio, I was, uh, we were one of the only black families. And Appalachia, Ohio is extremely poor. It's one of the poorest <laughs> places in this country. And we were one of the wealthier families there. So it was, it was odd because it was, there was jealousy coupled with um, envy, coupled with I want to be your friend, coupled with how are you, how do you have this house? Um, going to school, I will never forget, um, you know, I, the first time I was called the N-word. Um, but you know what? I'm going to give my brother a chance to talk about his experience, and then I can, I can dive into mine because I can talk forever, too. So you talk about yours, and then I'll ask Dad one more question, and then you'll take off, and I'll take your seat. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, we moved to Ohio. I was born in 1986. We moved to Ohio, I think it was 90, 91. And I was about four or five years old. I used to pinch. I'd never been around white kids. And I used to pinch kids because their skin would turn red. This was fascinating to me. Can you imagine that as a little kid? I was first called a nigger in the fourth grade. I didn't understand. This is a good friend of mine that called me this word. I didn't understand it. I had slept over at this, this kid's house. We were good friends. I didn't understand it. I think he wanted to fight me for some reason. I don't know. And um, I asked. My sister said, anybody calls you that name, you beat them up. <laughs> In the fifth grade, it progressed. In the fifth grade, it got a lot worse. Everybody. And so I got in a lot of fights. I didn't understand it. I didn't understand how to react to this. And today, I, I realized that these kids, you know, these were, uh, uh, maybe they saw me and uh, had a, a financial advantage that they didn't have trying to lash out, I don't know. But, you know, I did, so I got, I, I, I beat them up. When somebody called me the N-word, I got into a fight, I got in trouble. They never got in trouble. I got in trouble. And um, the principal, the, my teachers could never understand my perspective on, on why I react this way. I don't understand it. I understand it, it's, you know, that's a nasty word. I don't call uh, other people of color that word unless I'm using it as an insult. I never do. And so, I guess that's, that's, that's my uh, perspective that's, on race. That's it? All right. Well, I, I won't talk about my first experience, but I'll talk about, I think, the most pressing experience. So. Um, my boyfriend in high school, his name was Chad, and um, he was white, I was black. He's, he is white, I am black. And um, I remember going over to his house one time, and I was with my friend, um, Terry, and um, he had like this vicious pit bull. And you know, we always ran, like if the, if the pit bull wasn't chained up, we would like run back to the car. I was like, who could get back to the car the fastest? Go in the car and lock the doors, and this was before cell phones. We had pagers, but what, what good are those in a car? So one day we go over, and um, the pit bull is a loose, and we went back to the car, and I made it to the car first, and I accidentally locked the door before Terry got to the car, and that was not good. Then I unlocked it, but the dog had gotten a hold of her. So we go back home to my, to my house, and we're talking about it. And, I'm, and Terry's like, oh my god, I, I can't believe Mengele bit me. And we were talking you know, just about Mengele biting her. And my mom is like, Mengele? How many people have heard of Joseph Mengele? 
Well, Joseph Mengele, who this dog was named after, was a Nazi scientist who worked for Hitler. And my mom's like, who is Mengele? And I'm like, that's Chad's dog. And she's like, why does Chad have a dog named Mengele? And I'm like, I don't know, it's a cool name. She's like, Amelia, sit down. So she starts to teach me about who Mengele was. And I'm like, what the hell? So I go back to my boyfriend at the time, and I'm like, why do you have a dog named Mengele? And he's like, well, it's my cousin's dog, and he's in jail, and we're just watching it for him. And I'm like, oh, OK. Well, since you didn't name him, I guess it's OK. So long story short, um, his cousin comes home, and that's a whole another story um, that I'll save for another time, but just to, in the essence of time. Um, you know, a few years later, I go to a party with Chad. And Chad was like a bad boy. I liked bad boys when I was younger. <laughs> so he like would fight for no reason. I mean, if like, if like the, you know, you looked at him wrong, he's like, Wah. you know, and I'm like, oh, that's so hot. He can protect me. Um, so we go to this party and there's this other guy named Chad at this party and we walk in. And I knew Chad, the other Chad very well. Um, also, and we walk in and Chad says, hey girl, what are you doing here? Niggas aren't supposed to be here. And I'm like, I look at my Chad and I'm like, okay, there you go, get him. go ahead, get him. And my Chad looks at me and is like, why are you overreacting? And like that was heartbreaking to me. Like you would fight somebody for no reason at all with very little logic behind it. But somebody says something that's so insulting to me and I'm overreacting, needless to say, that was the end of our relationship. But you know, in the, in the 12th grade, I thought Chad and I were gonna get married. I thought like that was it. He was my, you know, he was my end all be all and it was a, it was a horrible breakup, but it was, it was very sad and it was very eye opening for me the way that racism exist, exists still exists in Appalachia, Ohio, and the triumphs and challenges that we have to go, we had to go through. So um, with that said, I do want to give Yasola an opportunity to speak. And so we'll say, we'll say goodbye to Dr. Mosley, but do you have any quick questions for him before he takes off? Cinda does. Oh, tell your band story, Dad. So this is segregation in, in the South. This is, um, this is related to lynching. How many people know about lynching? So it was very common, and people were made spectacles. And so it was very scary for especially black men in the South. So tell your story about being in the band. Well, this is the start, and even though I mean, you remembered it. Oh, yeah. But, uh, in my high school, we had a dance band that was formed by the principal, and we often played at events that were given by the local uh, uh, elite, people like the uh, 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 the country club, uh, veterans of foreign affairs, VFW. These were all segregated events, but. You know, we still had the best music. So once we were playing, this lady became so inebriated, she decided she wanted our principal, who played the saxophone. She began to dance to the way he was playing. She danced closer and closer. Everybody in our band got scareder and scareder. Because she was white. She was white and he was black, and all of the men there were half drunk anyway. But my principal was a very uh, ingenious man, and he saw that he had to break this woman of her spell. So he took his saxophone and began to play it like this as if he might hit her if she came too close. <laughs> I think she got the message. <laughs> but you did have to be very ingenious in avoiding all of the entrapments and all of the 
uh, sources of violence that was in the South. I will tell you my uh, experience with the N-word. The N-word was primarily used for me among blacks among one another. It signified the fact that whether you are educated or poor, or whether you are wealthy or, or not, that you are still a black person. You are a nigger to white people. And so it, caught, it, 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 it reflected a solidarity, you know, rather than a denigration. But again, these are different times and different places. Well, it certainly is uh, disparate, you know. Uh, one of the leading uh, rap groups was called Niggas with Attitude. And so that is almost like an oxymoron, really. Niggas are not supposed to have attitude or be proud, okay? So it is used in the black community in ways that uh, I think it is uh, uh, important that for non-black people to know that they don't have that uh, kind of experience that would produce the solidarity of being a nigger. So tonight I have to leave. Thank you all very much. I'm going to be on a panel on animal rights and climate change. Thanks, Dad. You will. So, we will continue this um, discussion. I think that, um, especially with that topic, it can be so loaded. Um, but Dr. Mosley ans partly answered your question, Lisa, um, because when it comes to the, the solidarity um, that he is speaking of and the experience that um, black people have to put for a non-black person to put themselves in that shoes and in those shoes and um, assume uh, that 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 entitlement um, can can often be um, dangerous and still offensive, right? It's it's like the word bitch, right? We sometimes women say that to other women, but if a man would say that, um, regardless of his intentions, uh, how would we take that? So. Um, but Yusola, tell us um, about your experiences at school, and um, they're very different from all of ours, so. <laughs> oh, okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Yusola, and I'm 14. I go to the Bement School in Deerfield. I've been going there since I was, since I turned six. And I've had so, like, a great time there. Next year will be my last year. It's really sad, but recently there was a incident involving the N-word, and one of my friends who I never thought would say this word, like said it, and he started asking me for an N-word pass. And if you don't know what that is, it's a pass to say the N-word, but you have to get it from a black person. So they would come up to me and be like, um, you solo, can such and such have an N-word pass? Can I have an N-word pass? I'd be like, no, that's not a thing. Like, if you say that, I, I would get so mad and infuriated that like my blood 
boils at this. So they'd always be like, can I have a pass? Can you tell, can I say the N word? I'm like, no. Like, so if anyone white or black, I don't like the word at all, like at all. So if anyone like says it, I immediately get, I immediately get mad. And I say, well, if you're gonna say the word, then you can't be friends with me. Like, I don't wanna talk to you. I don't wanna have any association with you if you're gonna use that word. Like, you can either stop and not say it at all, or we can be fine. But anyway, so this kid well, um, came up to me and he was like, can I have an N-word pass? I was like, no, leave me alone. And he came back the next day and at recess, he whispered the word in my ear and I was like, okay, I'm not gonna completely overreact about this because I did want to punch him, I'm sorry, I did. It's just how I felt in the moment, I did. <laughs> um, but I was reasonable and I went to Mr. Belcher, who is our Dean of Students, and he handled the situation very quick, very quick, like the next day, he came up to me and he was like, um, well, I talked to someone, I, well, he talked to the person, and he talked to the other kids who also antagonized me with the word, like they would, like I'd text them, and they would um, like, type N, N, N over and like N, I over to me as if they're gonna say it. And I'm like, you know what, if you're gonna do that, don't talk to me at all, don't, like, just don't. And I told my dean of students about this and he was like, okay. So he had to talk with these kids. Um, he gave them a very strong lesson, he's like, I, th um, I handled it very well, but I think I scared the crap out of him. And I was like, good. And well, so that was what happened. The kids apologized to me, so we're okay now. Um, it's very, very, mm, I don't wanna say maddening, but that's a word, is that a word? Yeah, it's a word, okay. Maddening, and it makes me so, mad to the point where I want to scream. So it just, it's not that I can help what they're thinking and what they do, but if I did, if I did, I wouldn't have them have this mindset that they think they can say this word. Um, this is not the first time it's actually happened. The second time I had a friend, um, and she used to go to Bement. She went there for one year. And she, we still kept in touch even though she left. She went to... Um, a different school. Yeah, she goes to a different school now. She's fine. Um, but we would still FaceTime. And when we FaceTimed, she'd always be listening to, you know, like rap music. And they'd always say the N-word in it. And she um, would say the word like when she's listening to it. And I'm like, can you not say that word, please? Like, can you just not? And she would be like, N-word, no. And I said, what? And I, she said, she called me the N-word and said, no. And I said, and well, I hung, I hung up. And um, I don't know what happened after that. Yeah, so I hung up and then I sent her this long paragraph of saying, Look, you can say the word and not be my friend and have no association with me at all, or you cannot say the word, and I said, not say the word and not be a racist and be my friend. And she said, she texted me the N word back, and then she said no. And I was like, well, we're, not, we're just not gonna be friends. And she said, okay, bye, and then um, it was, this is a long story, but um, <laughs> she texts, she, so we haven't, she didn't talk to me for about a year, and then um, she texted me writing this long paragraph and saying, I'm sorry, like I didn't know 
at the time I didn't know it was hurting you and I feel really, really, truly horrible for what I did. And I said, okay, well, I forgive you and thank you for apologizing. Um, because she, I could also understand where she's coming from because she actually has not the best, it's life. Like there's some stuff, that's a different story. But she, um, she said, I'm sorry, and I was like, okay. And we're mutual, we don't talk much, but um, it's just this word and how it's used now, because every kid now just says it. It's like they think they can say it no matter what their race is. Like they don't know the history behind the word. Mm -hmm. Like the his they didn't use this term as a term of endearment. That's not, we're not, it's not a nice word. They know that, kids know that, everyone knows that. But they don't care and they don't care how it affects people. And that's just something that it happens and I wish I could change how it affects people. I wish people wouldn't say it at all, but unfortunately, I can't. I can only do tell them not to say it. But yeah. Thank you. Okay, here's the thing. The, per the dean of students is also the history teacher. So I think he gave him a lesson. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so he's a history teacher. So I'm pretty sure the person knows that, the history, and not to say it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've even had it come from refs before. What? So I refs? Yeah. So I, I just, and what, you know, it, yeah, and a parent on the, and one time a black ref, which really just threw me off, but, um, so I just, I don't really know what to, how to, how to, what to say to them. It's so hard because, you know, you're, they have to take a higher road, but that can yeah. be so hard when that's coming to them out of anger in the way that it is consistently throughout a game. I mean, like, so the coaches and the refs don't always hear anything on the field or on the court when the kids are all huddled up and close together, right? But what they yeah. see is the reaction, like, I'm sorry. You solo? Yeah, I can oh, solo too. Oh, oh, Charles, Charles. Charles, Charles. right? So they, the refs, or don't see what's going on. What they see is the child who pushes the kid that says, right. don't call yeah. that, right? It's or like he does an extra kick, you know, our kids will, will fight back, right? And, you know, we, I'd like to say all the teams that my kids have been involved with are very family oriented, right? So if you insult one and you're on the other team, you're going to get the whole the team kind of feeling what's welcome. But I just really have a hard time sitting down having that conversation with them about, like, what is the proper response? Like you're a child, so I don't want you to start arguing with the ref, right? That's not your place. You can tell your coach, but you know our coaches have gotten technical for speaking out, right? So it's just kind of like, how do we handle this? It's because it comes in different angles from when kids think it's okay because it's in a rap song, which it's not, and but yeah. it also comes out of straight like I know that this word is going to upset you, and I'm feeling salty because we're you guys are beating us, right? And it's like how do we? children. Well, that's why I think that doing a forum like this is really important to be able to have a civil conversation. And remember, one of the goals from this was progress. 
and inviting refs and inviting teammates and inviting them to conversations like this and not letting this conversation end in this room. This conversation has really, the, the topic of the N-word has, has definitely taken over. We've got like five more topics, but it's seven o'clock, but I'm glad it's organic right now and we're asking questions and we're interacting and nobody's falling asleep and everybody's drinking and it's great, so. Yeah, yeah. So I think that having these kinds of conversations in schools and in the community and having people who, you know, can express their feelings. I mean, my child is not an angry child. I've actually never heard her say that she, like, is angry that many times in, like, one sentence or two, this many sentences ever in her entire life, her 14 years of living on this earth. Um, so for something to get her blood boiling that much... It, as it does mine too, um, is also a representation of like, you know, regardless of who says it over here or who gives a pass over here, this is how it affects me. And that's what people need to understand is like, you know, I started off by saying there's no monolithic representation of blackness here. Like I don't represent all black people. Rappers don't represent all black people. The boy who gave the, the other kids a past doesn't represent all black people. So if I'm telling you that it's not okay and you don't respect that, like you're gonna have a problem too. Yes, Jeff. I have a comment more than a question. Okay. I see a lot so in the military I saw tons of racism, anti Semitism, any type of derogatory that you have this is no different than the Me Too movement, for example, where a lot of things were socially acceptable for a while. Not that they were acceptable, but everyone went along with it because this is what everyone's doing. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of misogynistic things in the workplace where women were degraded or treated differently and appropriately because it was socially acceptable because everyone, it's a mob mentality. If everyone does it, no one speaks up. It doesn't make it okay, but it means that everyone accepts it as the norm. Right. Now the norm has changed, right? So right. people are standing up for themselves, people speak up. The key is, is continually speaking up for things that you disagree with. I mean, I dealt with, you know, being Jewish in the military, all sorts, I mean, you, you get, I mean, you're gonna get made fun of for anything, and the problem is, is you have to pick your battles because whether it's acceptable or not, you still have to fit in into your surroundings, you still have to deal with work, you still have to, yeah. you know, I mean, we just watched some documentary on, um, what, what was that movie that we watched about the, uh, the woman, the bombshell? Oh, um, oh yeah. Um, Bombshell was something to be about, about NBC, Fox you know, and, and, oh, yeah, Fox, Fox, yeah, Fox, Fox News, you know, where they, uh, Katie, uh, sorry, I can't think of her name, the, um, Kelly. No, Kelly, Megan Kelly. Yeah, Megyn Kelly had her, had her show, and she, when she spoke up, then, then, you know, she kind of gave a voice behind it, and, you know, gave, you know, people started coming forward. Yeah. Um, the problem is, is in isolated situations, you're the only one, if you're the only, I mean, right. sometimes, a lot of kids are doing this because they like kids like to push the limits. It doesn't mean that they're racist. They just they want to say something that they're not supposed to say. They want to do something and push the boundaries. You know, and some kids are. So you have a balance. Uneducated. If some kids are generically racist, some kids are not, and they're just not educated enough of how to respond. Same I, with. Yeah, I think when it comes to racism in this country, it is so ingrained in the fabric and the history of this country. We all possess a little racism, whether it's internalized racism um, between blacks and blacks or unconscious racism where it's like, well, I didn't know or overt racism where it's like, yeah, I'm trying to offend you and I'm trying to get you mad um, and get a rise out of you. So there's so many aspects to racism and it's such a long part of the history of this country that it's almost, I don't want to say inherent or natural, um, but the conditioning starts at a very young age. And the important thing about racism and combating racism is to be aware of racism and white privilege and with every choice that we make regarding those, um, whether it be um, I mean, we were going to get into like real estate and redlining and blockbusting, and then I know John, you would have some questions about that. But we're we're running out of time. So, but you know, in every the institutional racism, systemic racism, the prison systems. You know, there's many prisoners and uh, many uh, there are as many uh, African American prisoners in jail as there were slaves. Uh, we're not naturally. Uh, violent or cr criminal or aggressive people. So there's a systemic issue with that that um, 
almost seems natural. Like, well, that's, that's how it is in the ghetto, or that's how it is, you know, over there. Um, and it's not. It's not. It's a system that was created. Um, I've grown up in two different worlds. And uh, W.E.B. Du Bois talked about something called double consciousness, uh, where you, know, you act one way around white people and you act another way around black people. Um, and I've grown up in both of those worlds. And I've seen white people get pulled over and I've seen black people get pulled over. I've seen you know, white people interact with cops and I've seen black people interact with cops. And it's, um, it's a very different experience. So I think that uh, when it comes to to any type of racism or any type of ism, yeah, it is important to stand up. It's never okay. Um, but to understand with the choices that we make um, in that moment and at that time, even if it's a choice that, we, even if it's something that we have to be conscious of with 90% of the choices that we make in a day, um, being conscious of it is the best way to combat it and to, to work towards the progress that we're trying to work towards. So, yeah. Right. Right. It's tough. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You just preached. Well, I just want to say something uh, real quickly on behalf of you, Yasola, and your friend who uh, you had that uh, altercation with and uh, didn't speak for a year or whatever. And I feel very uh, good. I don't know who the friend was, and I don't need to know, but I feel very good. I feel like you did something because she did come back even after that time and write you a long letter of apology. So that's absolutely meaningful and I just you know wish everybody could be like that and you for your bravery and her for her apology. Amelia let's redline it again. Can you just go into why there is a difference between the success of black people today and white people today because of um, systemic racism and government programs in the 50s and 60s because that's something a lot of people aren't aware so how many people know what redlining is? Wow, that's impressive. Um, well, loaded. Systemic, you want to talk no, about redlining? Um, you would probably explain it better. The only thing I can think of is a raisin in the sun, that's and that's not. We that. John can explain it. Banker John. Banker John. I hope this is not a practice at, no, just kidding. Greenfield is awesome. Redlining was actually systemic. It was a, I can just talk. It was, no, a, no, no. It was a government program. Yeah, the, for the video. And it's not for TV. Uh, it was a government program that encouraged banks to lend in certain neighborhoods and not others. And it's kind of ironic because now we have programs that were established by the government to make sure we're not doing this. But at the time, we were doing it. And they actually had standards that would say, this neighborhood you can lend in, this one you can't lend in. And that combined with the GI Bill, and I, I'm not really an expert in this area. Actually, my knowledge largely stems from uh, a special on PBS that was done that uh, I watched on this. But when the GI Bill was established, I think only 2% were not white that got this money. So after World War II, all these people had the opportunity, they come out of World War II and they have the opportunity to buy a house and get low interest rate financing to buy this house. And that allowed the whites to develop so much more wealth 
following World War II than people of color. And it wasn't just blacks, it was Hispanics. It was basically, I mean, I, I think the best way to say it is 98% of the money went to white families. And, and so redlining then, uh, I think after fair housing, right, in, I, I saw on your timeline, 68, I, somewhere around there they, they stopped doing this, but it still stayed around because I remember in 87 when I started in the business, I remember we, I used to uh, advise banks, one bank buying another bank, we'd go and we'd look at their loan portfolio and I remember going and sitting with a couple of older people one time and one of them said, yeah, you remember the days when the application came in and they put the little red dot on there? And the point of the little red dot was they weren't allowed to say that a person of color had applied, but if they put the red dot on there, it told them that it was a person of color and they looked at the loan differently. So now they're actually really, really strict standards. You cannot put any mark on a loan application for a residential mortgage. You can't have anything on there at all for that very reason. And so. Thank goodness redlining is, now, now there are strict rules against it, but it was not propagated by the banks. It was, it was created by the government, and the, and, and the banks were forced to enforce it. Yeah. But wasn't it more than just black people? It was if a neighborhood was more than a certain percent black, that even if you were white, trying to buy a house in that neighborhood, you couldn't get a mortgage because it was a neighborhood that wasn't desirable and loanable. And yeah. the government told you you couldn't give loans if there was a number of... Uh, that was percentage. steering, I think. They actually had maps with red lines on them. Yeah, they had maps with red lines. Red lines. Yeah. yeah. They just wouldn't make loans in those neighborhoods. Yeah. No matter what race you were, because of the makeup. Because of the... And usually they were separated by train tracks. So the black neighborhoods were not desirable neighborhoods. Um, the white neighborhoods, which were desirable neighborhoods, black people couldn't get loans to buy houses in. Yeah, and so there was this play called A Raisin in the Sun, which was written by Lorraine Hansberry. And she was, what, 26 years old when she wrote the play. It was a very, very good play. Um, and uh, there were many things that happened in this play. I suggest everybody either read it or see it. I think there's even the latest version of it is with Puffy, and so it's like a 2000 and something version. Um, but they, uh, one aspect of it really looked at um, not redlining, but steering. So steering is like, oh, you don't want to buy in that neighborhood. You want to buy in this neighborhood. So really trying to influence and persuade people to not, if you were white, not buy in a black neighborhood and vice versa. Of course, if you were black, definitely don't buy in a white neighborhood. We don't want them in our neighborhoods. So they bought a house in the white neighborhood and um, her husband had died, the matriarch of the family. Her husband had died and left some insurance money. And her son wanted to open a liquor store with the money and everybody had their hopes and dreams. The daughter wanted to go to medical school. Um, but ultimately, she did, go to, she did go to medical school. But ultimately, they wanted to buy this house in this white neighborhood. So the, what was it, the Neighborhood Association? Yeah. The Neighborhood Association came to their house and said, and tried to persuade them not to buy the house. Um, and it was really powerful to watch. They were going to pay them. Um, and um, should I tell them the end or no? No, don't tell them the end. The end? <laughs> All right, I'm going to leave it right there. And then you, it was on PBS too, but you can probably see it on Netflix. Read the book. Read the book. Read the book before you watch it. That's very good. Um, you have a question, and then Felice has a question. Um, my name is Jennifer. Jennifer, hi. <laughs> I just wanted to break it down, and I'm not quite sure if it's in with steering or redlining, but the the whole result of the housing market back then caused such chaos because when African Americans started buying in those predominantly white neighborhoods, for all those years they've been the the white homeowners were told that the property values will go down, go down. right? And so what ends up happening is a loss of you know decent roads because your public works department there's no taxes there as a result and your school system it doesn't have the funding to get educated as well so like when you break that down into the systematic yep process of that it really gives you a good defining or definition of how it was it's not that people who are now in those circumstances can just pull themselves up and exactly move on. this is something that was basically done to them and to a degree where it was like you were told if you if 
you sold your house to a black family that the whole property value of the whole neighborhood. The whole neighborhood, in. yeah. And then so then the white families start moving out because now the property values are going down. And I'd just like to also say that on that GI Bill, they literally write things like if colored people are you know, live here, the property values. I mean, it was yeah. that driven by the government and explicit. So. And you know, Jennifer, redlining doesn't exist now, but gentrification does. So it's yes. like, if you buy a property here, you know, if it's too many black people in a neighborhood in 2020, the property value is going to go down. And, you know, like I said, I'm from D.C., and that leads into a, another point really quick, Felice. Um, you know, because this is supposed to be the Mosley story and how it's unique, right? My dad bought tons of property in D.C. I'm actually mad because he sold it all. I mean, we'd be like multi, multi-millionaires. Um, but he had so much property in D.C. on Florida Avenue and on U Street and um, where else? K Street. I mean, just the most. And now these were black neighborhoods in D.C., not desirable, D.C. proper. I mean... One of those houses now is probably worth two million dollars. Even the house that we sold on Shepherd Street is will we sell it for one hundred and fifty thousand? My grandmother's house. The house that my grandma, my great grandmother, and my aunt bought um, was sold for one hundred and fifty thousand, and now it's probably worth two fifty, and it's worth millions now. So all of the um, the whites have moved in in D.C. proper, and. Um, I mean, when I lived there, Southeast was like one of the most dangerous places. Like I didn't, I actually don't even go, haven't even gone to Southeast that much throughout my life. And now Southeast looks like um, Northampton, Massachusetts. So, you know, gentrification still exists. I have properties in Holyoke and the good part of Holyoke and the not so good part of Holyoke, you know, and I rent them out and there are certain types of renters for those neighborhoods. So. Um, though redlining and blockbusting and steering don't exist um, legally and on paper, um, the, the philosophies and the principles are still very much alive in 2020. Police, what were you going to say? This is a little bit different along different topics, which is some of us have been Yes, and we had a talk after yeah, we went to see it. After. And so I guess kind of like this. Yeah. <laughs> and really thinking, and I wanted to ask this question to your mom and your dad about just just your role in the civil rights movement and having such a prominent prominent role in it and alongside prominent figures is. And this is something that I've wondered about. Growing up Jewish and inheriting some, um, what did you call it? First? This heritage of trauma, Oppression. right? Generational Oppression, trauma. generational trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, having myself in my life, I grew up in a predominantly Jewish area, um, yet then being out in the world, I've been called a kike before, I've been called a Jew bitch in my life. Right in the experience of my life and knowing where my 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 grandparents had come over, they were forced out. Some of, some of my relatives were in the Holocaust, and I guess my question is: Is there? Do you find that there has been a certain? Um, although it's extremely different, right? like the racism that you have experienced throughout life, do you find that there's a certain type of shared experience or understanding of with other um, cultures and peoples that have been oppressed? Like is there a certain kind of identification with which of, does, does this make the question make any sense yeah, at all? I yeah, I, I just wonder about that. Okay, well, first of all, what I would say is that uh, to answer your question, yes, I do find that there is uh, a difference and that the difference to, to me has been uh, generational. 
And what I have learned and what I have seen, and I've done a lot of things around young people. I went to Smith College and got an MFA when I was 72 years old. So I was like the grandmother <laughs> in playwriting. So I was the grandmother in the class. And I saw, and I love young people, that's the other thing. But I saw the way that the uh, students interacted with one another. And going backward, uh, before that, and living in D.C., I, um, because it was, again, at that time, it was the 60s. Everything was happening in the 60s, and everything was happening in D.C. in the 60s. So a lot of people, you know, civil rights activists, lots of people were coming to D.C., and uh, I had a lot of friends, and I was very fortunate to meet. To not, okay, that's, okay. I, have, I, I was fortunate to meet a lot of the people who came, who had Be been honest. in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and who had done a lot of work already in the South. And so, so I got that, um, that uh, uh, I guess it was a blessing to meet them. But there were, uh, well, I wasn't like, oh, here's this person meeting these people. Everybody was meeting people because what was happening in the 60s was that there, for young people, and I was still young at the time, there was a, uh, an idea about, first of all, know your history. You know, you got to know where you came from before you're going to know where you're going. And that was big, and people really lived by that and meant that. And also, the other thing was consciousness. You've got, if you don't have a conscious mind, then what are you going to have? So there was this whole notion of consciousness. And out of that notion of consciousness came the notion of black consciousness. If you're black, you know, then you need to be conscious and you need to know what it means to be a black person. So cut your little hair and go get an afro, first of all, and love yourself, you know. And it wasn't like somebody preaching to you, it was just like this whole notion of consciousness was very real to myself and to people growing up uh, in, in the 60s. So as well as meeting, you know, meeting people. So, so yes, going backwards, that's what happened to me going forward because I hope I came out with that kind of consciousness, which I hope hasn't gone away, I can look at young people and I can see the difference. I can see the difference between how I was developing this consciousness and how people, young people, your soul and her friends, and how they relate to one another. And there is a difference and I am so thankful for it and it gives me hope. So yes, and that, but the difference that I see is more in the generations than in anything else. My mom's being modest. Her, she's pinching me. <laughs> yes. She had very nice, good friends who did a lot of work in the civil rights movement. It's on there that you were, that Mary and Barry at least was one of your friends. <laughs> Charles has to. I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm not ashamed to mention it, but but uh, but but there were lots, so many people, and so I don't want to just signal out, you know, people and say, oh, you know, I knew so and so. Uh, if you look and see who, who was in D.C. in the '60s, Marion Barry, you know, was was one of the people. He was a very, very, very dear friend. You know, there were lots of people. I mean, Stokely Carmichael was another good friend. There were Ed Brown. You know, these were people who had been in the South and who had done a lot of work and who ended up uh, in D.C. And my best friend at the time was a, a person who had worked. I didn't work in SNCC, but she had done that, and she, you know, I just. Uh -huh, Elizabeth, and I met a lot of, I just met, and, and that's how D.C. was. People were coming to D.C. all the time, you know. I wrote a play on the March on Washington called Criss Crossing, and you know, and maybe it'll get produced if that person standing there is, <laughs> does it. <laughs> so, you know, but that, but because that's the kind of uh, awareness and consciousness that, you know, that people have without going into a whole lot of detail uh, about it, you know. Uh, Okay, so Marion Barry, first of all, I met him at my friend's house who had been in the South and done, done, done work uh, with the uh, voting, voting rights uh, situation, Elizabeth. And she had a party, and I met Marion Barry at her party. And uh, he, we became friends. He was a, an incredibly nice, 
gentleman, very handsome at the time, uh, and everything. And um, you know, I went out with him a couple of times. It didn't really didn't go anywhere too far in that respect. But <laughs> but but the good thing but the good thing about Marion Barry was that he was just such a good person. And he was so, before all this happened to him, and I can say this and you can go and look it up on the internet, he did so much for the city of DC. He did so much in the very beginning for black people. He loved black people and he came from the south. He was born in either being in Mississippi or somewhere like that. And he came up, he had been chairman of SNCC, and he came up to DC and he started what they call was the bus boycott. And at that time, the capital transit system was only, uh, there were only white bus drivers on, on that system. And, uh, you know, but most of the people that rode on the buses were black. And he started a boycott. And the boycott was very successful. And then his rise just went from there. He did many things, just one other, many, many things, but he started a, a, a organization called Pride Incorporated. And Pride Incorporated was something that got businesses to give jobs to the youth in DC so that they could not have to be on the street or whatever and they would have jobs and, they, and, and, and he got it funded. That was an enormous effort. He had a lot of people helping him, but it was his creation and he did that. So those were just uh, a couple of the things that he did. But he did one thing after another for the city of DC and for the people in DC. And he was pr primarily interested in you know, helping black people become uh, better economically. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of people hated him for that, believe me. A lot of people because they couldn't buy him. And when he died, he died with no, with no money. You know, he had a house, nice little house out in Southeast DC, but he did not take anything from the government. Unfortunately, he did have some health issues, as I'm sure everybody is aware of, but he didn't steal anything, and he was always, always amazing to the people, and he loved the people, and I think he was voted uh, re-elected re two times, or maybe even three times. That's how good he was, and how sincere he was. So. <laughs> no, I didn't do it. I was his friend. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, well, oh, yeah, of, of course, of course. And I went over to the SNCC, you know, to the office and answered phones and, you know, did mail, you know, mail mailings and stuff like that. So, you know, and, uh, and I always, always, but I was just like everybody else in D.C. Everybody supported Marion Barry. Every black person in the city supported him. I was just one of many, you know. But we were good. For, we were also very good friends, and he was a wonderful, wonderful person. And uh, DC will never be the same without him. He was amazing. Did you know Stokely Carmichael? I knew Stokely. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. I did. Yeah. But that's another story, and that's more. Well, that's kind of a personal story. So, <laughs> so, so, so I've said enough. <laughs> well, well. I do want to ask you one other question, though. Tell us about, um, I think, you know, Felice, this kind of touches on your question about being able to have um, solidarity between races and ethnicities and generations. Um, one thing my parents did for me was, you know, I, I started traveling with them at a very young age. So the first time I left the country, I was two years old. Um, we went to Paris. My parents took me to Paris. I don't remember it. I just have pictures. Um, and, you know, I've traveled all over the world with my parents, which has given me the confidence um, to be able to talk in front of a group of people without being incredibly nervous. Um, I have the confidence to sit down at Buckingham Palace, and I have the confidence to sit down on somebody's, um, you know, front stoop in, in Springfield and drink a beer with them. Um, I've been to so many different places and I can relate to so many different people and I have a, I feel like a genuine um, connection um, with people and I think that that, you know, being able to travel and travel the world and experience um, interactions, you know, form friendships, form bonds, form bonds with people 
uh, on so many different levels from so many different places um, is, is a really, uh, it's a nice healing process for all of the trauma that, you know, we're put through, uh, especially in America. I mean, America has its own little you know, we have we have our definitely have our issues around uh, race and economics and gender that are so uh, backwards and like you know compared to the rest of the developed world are are very um, you know uh, not as as forthcoming. So um, I think that that that's important being able to travel. And I want my mom to talk a little bit about uh, when she uh, lived in Paris. And then Charles, you can talk about when we travel to Paris and South Africa and your experiences traveling the world. Oh. Well, you know, okay. <laughs> so, so, okay, let me just start by saying, I wasn't like the greatest student in high school. <laughs> I went to a Catholic school. I was good in Latin and, uh, that's prob and biology. That's probably about it, you know. I liked English, I liked everything, but those were the things. Uh, you couldn't take uh, uh, French without having taken Latin first. So I took Latin and then I took French and loved, loved, loved French. So as a result of loving French so much, I just decided when it was time for me to graduate from high school, I asked my father and my mother, neither of, of whom were rich, you know, but if I promised to go for a year and do really well, they would give each give me seventy five dollars uh, a, a month, and I had researched it. This was in nineteen sixty four, I think, and so it was not expensive. And I had done all the research, so so that. But I loved French, and I loved you know, just loved the language. So I went to Paris because I loved French, and um, I ended up just going back and forth to Paris and really in, enjoying it and met a lot of uh, very interesting people there. And it was also a time, it was in the 60s, so there was a, a lot going on in Paris too. And uh, I ended up just um, meeting people who were more political than I had been and they were explaining a lot of stuff to me about politics and you know what was going on. Again, this whole consciousness thing, I, was, I didn't really know a lot of a lot of things, and there were people who um, who I met who were very you know like uh, just all kinds of really really well known people, and uh, I learned a lot. Um, and so that's I guess what Amelia is talking about because that changed my life quite a bit. Um, but that's enough said about it, and it was it was a great experience, and uh, we try to go back when we can, so. Yeah, <laughs> and I've got to take your soul a bit so that she can study ballet because she's been taking ballet for the past 10 years and she's on, she's on, she's on point now. So uh, she deserves a trip to Paris once things get a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Charles, you can talk about your experiences traveling. So I don't remember what age it was, but when uh, we went to Ghana, I had an afro about twice the size. <laughs> And all these kids are following me around and said, Soul Man, Soul Man. South Africa. Oh, that was in South Africa? Mm -hmm. Okay. It was, okay. In, uh, it was in uh, uh, Cape Town. It was here in Cape Town. And they said, Soul Man, I felt so good. <laughs> Saying, yo, these kids like my afro. It's the first time I really uh, felt glorified, you know, looking the way I look. Because I think we still lived in Athens. No, we we lived here, but I, I've never, I've never been uh, uh, admired like that before. I don't think, and it was just so beautiful, and it made me appreciate myself more. And I love my afro. <laughs> um, I've never traveled to France, but. I went to Montreal. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I can't really say much about it. Um, I loved Montreal. It's just, I didn't know French. So my grandmother was like my translator. Because I, I mean, they spoke English, but they had like a French-ish, Canadian French accent. So I'm like, Grammy, what are they saying? <laughs> But yeah, I haven't really traveled. Yes, yes, yes. 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 
I will take a ballet class in Paris one day. Yes, you will. So um, I think that concludes most of what we wanted to talk about. You got a sense of our story, our, our family story. Do you want to say a story? You want to say a story too? So I have to be honest. I'm prejudiced. I have prejudice. The most people that have uh, been down on me, the most people that have insulted me have been poor, white. And I have a, a, a bias against uh, some poor white people. My, my uh, family has uh, befriended and uh, taken in a lot of poor white people, but uh, I still have a bias because those are the people that have called me names, those are the people that I've fought. And so I have a bias. A prejudice or a bias? What's that? A prejudice or a bias? A, a prejudice. prejudice. I have a president, and uh, I don't know if I'm ashamed. It's the, it's the uh, I don't think I am ashamed because it's the experiences that I went through in Ohio and uh, the part of Ohio that I was in, I, I, I don't like it, and uh, uh, God forbid I ever go back, it was, um, not a good experience. And coming here was just, uh, I actually made a, a little video, it was a culture shock. Because I'd never been around so many uh, different ethnicities. And, you know, I didn't know, you know, really how to talk. You know, I didn't really, I mean, I, you know, I listened to hip hop and so, you know, I, I kind of uh, had to uh, assimilate. And, uh, but, uh, so I, I, Ohio was tough. Yes. I'll say, I'll say Ohio was traumatizing. I mean, like, you heard two stories about living in Appalachia, Ohio. I could tell you the story about when I saw a KKK rally and my friends told me I was overreacting. I could tell you stories about when I was in track practice and people were talking about my black skin and calling me the N-word, I could tell you stories about when people said, you guys shouldn't have a hot tub, you guys shouldn't have a house this big, you guys shouldn't have this, you shouldn't have this, but why? Because I'm black, I shouldn't have this? And that's exactly what they were saying. And it was so often, it was like almost daily, it's traumatizing. And, um, you know, for the most part, I think because of the way that I was raised, I have this sense of entitlement that most black people don't have a sense of entitlement. I think it, it comes across, you know, just like when I open my mouth, um, which I'm okay with, you know, like I've, I've learned to accept me. That's who I am, right? But, you know, with this, this sense of entitlement, I kind of, you know, brush some issues that really do um, affect me, I brush them off, but my experience with racism in Ohio is that, but then, you know, moving to Massachusetts and then just experiencing racism in, in other parts of the country, and other parts of the world, it's, it's different in 2020, right? It's like, oh my gosh, you're so articulate. <laughs> you talk like that? Are you black? Oh my gosh, all the, over the phone? I did have one lady tell me, she was like, we were over, talking over the phone and then we met in person. She was like, I thought you were. And I'm like, you thought I was what? <laughs> She's like, well, I mean, I talk blacker than you. And I'm like, um, please sit down. You know, so it's like, I'm not supposed to talk this way. I'm not supposed to think this way. I'm not supposed to act this way. I'm kind of pretty. You're like not a normal black girl. But really? Because that's also not a compliment, but a form of racism. And it's, I experienced that a lot as well. And so then that's confusing. That's confusing. How do you navigate through that? Like, am I supposed to say thank you? So now my mom's gonna say something. And then Yusola has a story. 
Okay, well, I just wanted to say, we didn't <laughs> intentionally do anything, like she said. But, you know, uh, uh, and, and it's okay. But uh, as I said, with the whole notion of consciousness, Amelia grew up in a very black household, first of all, with the, if you saw her, my husband and myself with the experiences and everything. So it was, um, it was something that I saw too. I dealt with it a different way because for one thing I'm older and a little bit more, you know, just savvy about how to deal with that. But as a young person, she's absolutely right, you know, in what she was saying. And for a long time, I don't think Al or I realized the kind of uh, situation that by living in Athens, Ohio and working at Ohio University that we put uh, Amelia and Charles in because they had to go to school there. You know, I had a really good job and he was a professor. You know, we could go and live in a whole other world. And we didn't really realize it and the time went by very quickly and they grew up very fast. And I know that, you know, they were trying to absorb and do whatever they could. And they had really nice friends. I yeah. mean, they were really nice, but it was absorbing that other side and that other culture. And so, um, so that was the thing, and that was what we have to be sorry about and, and, and no. own, and well, and it's actually, well, no, it's not, it's not, but no, they did it, but we, you know, we didn't see it, you know, and we have to acknowledge that, uh, and we do, we do, so. Well, you guys gave us a great life, so let's just hope okay. you guys did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> um, just saying. Wait, what was my story? Oh. Um, so, um, I have a story from when I was, when I was in first grade, first through third. It's not long, sort of. So, um, I was in first grade, and there was this troubled kid. Troubled. Well, not troubled kid, but he was like bad. He was mean, like he was bad. And um, I have, I remember. We were in Mrs. Pelletier's class, who was our music teacher. And well, I can't believe I remembered her name. Um, we were in music class, and the kid, I was sitting next to a boy, and I think I was sitting next to one of my friends, and he goes, I don't want to sit next to a person with, who's black. And I'm like, I'm seven, so I don't know how to react. So I'm like shocked, but I, I didn't know what to say. So my teacher threw him out of the class and she goes, go to Miss Panic right now. She like screams at him that. And I'm like, um, what just happened? Cause I'm like in shock of what happened. Cause I, I'm like, I don't know how to react. What do I do? And so he got thrown out of the class we got an in-school in suspension for like a day. And then we're fine. And then second grade, he did this something similar. And same thing happened, but he got a longer suspension. I don't know how long it was. And then in third grade, we have the biography fair. And um, he goes, we were reading, it was K-Bar, and it was morning meeting. And he goes, um, you should be Martin Luther King Jr. for the biography fair. And I go, what? And he said, you should be MLK Jr., you know, because of your skin tone. And I'm like, that makes no sense at all. Just because I'm black doesn't mean I have to be someone else who is black. I mean, I was, but it was my choice. Like, he didn't decide for, who, for me who yeah. I needed to be and who I wanted to be and who I should be. Because that's my choice. It's my project. And um, a kid in my class goes, or not, well, he is in my class, but we were morning meeting. So he goes, Zola, you know that's racist, right? And I go, no. And he goes, you should tell the teacher. And I go, okay. So I go up and tell the teacher. And then my mom, she told my mom, and she was like, well, handle it. And my mom's like, okay. I don't know what she did. 
She was like, she was mad. She was very mad. I know that. I'm shaking. Um, but she's like, my mom was mad. But they did handle the situation. He did get another in-school suspension for, I want to say like four days, five days, roughly that. He got in trouble a lot, like a lot, because he was mean. He like. But he was racist. He was. He's nice now. We're 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 chill. He um he apologized. He like apologized back then, which was like six years ago. What grade am I? Eighth grade. So like five years ago. Um, but he apologized, and we still go to the same school. He's we're fine now, but like I tried to avoid him kindergarten through fifth grade because I did not want to get teased. Oh my god, I'm shaking so much. Um, um, I just avoided him. And then like sixth grade, um, we started and he started talking to me more and I'm like, hi. And he's like, hi. And I'm like, okay, bye. <laughs> But that's my that's the story I wanted to share. That's like another side of something that happened. I don't know. I talked about it in the car. I performed all this in the car. Yeah. Thank you. I'm glad that we were able to share these stories and I think, you know, it's my goal at least for this family, you know, every family, every Person, every individual, we all have ups and downs, we all have triumphs, we all have successes, we all have failures, we all have setbacks. Um, it's a part of life, but I think for this family, it's important for us. I mean, I know my parents, well, let's start with my great grandparents, right? So, my, my great grandmother, college educated, I hope that diploma is still in the room. Is it still here? Okay. <laughs> um, you know, college educated, and she wanted to provide a certain type of life for her children, right? And then her children came along, and my grandmother wanted to provide a certain type of life for my mother, and then my mother wanted to provide a certain type of life for me, and now I want to provide a certain type of life for my daughter. And with each generation, our goal is, you know, I just want my daughter to have a better life than I did. And my life was great. So growing up in Ohio, like, it was traumatizing because of the outside influences. But at home, everything was, like, gravy, you know. And we can't control the things that other people do. But we can have conversations like these and, and, and help people develop conscious minds. So... Yeah. So, you know, Thank you so much. family You're moment. Doing a good job, Mom. <laughs> Thanks, honey. See the love. We also have love. We have love in this family. So, um, and that's what we. Yeah, we'll we'll talk afterwards because then I'll actually have um, a real cocktail, and uh, we'll talk and we'll mix and mingle and we'll make it informal. But that's the goal, right? We just want. Um, our, our next generation to be more successful and to have less heartaches and to have um, a better life than we did. So I hope that our story um, impacted you today. I hope that you learned something about the Mosleys and you learned something about race relations and you learned something about uh, not every black story is the same and we're all, you know, even within this family we have our own stories and um, thank you Jakes Thanks, Chris and Alex, for allowing us to use this place. Thank you, Cinda, for organizing this. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for videoing me, and I hope the skinny lens is on. Skinny lens. You skinnier. Or some Photoshop going on. Everybody have a great night.